It's been a few weeks for me. Um, we've been working our way through the book of Acts, and I've, what I intended to take 11 weeks, then got interrupted for various reasons, including several trips to Alabama to see my mother. Many of you will know that my mom passed this past Monday, and we had her funeral on Thursday, and I, I did the eulogy, which was a great privilege. It was hard, but it was, it was good. Uh, I mentioned that to you to say, you know, this is, this is what's been my life the past several weeks. So I've been in and out of class, and everyone's been very gracious about that and understanding, and I appreciate that. And lots of people have checked up on us, and we've been surrounded by love and grace and all those things. I will say more about my mom here in a few minutes. Uh, but also, many of you will also have heard that uh, Wednesday night on the way to True North, or the church, Mary and Lila Beth were in a car accident. They were on Pitts Lane and they got um, a lady hit one car and then uh, had a um, head on collision with them. Totaled our car. Lila Beth got some minor scrapes. It was worse on Mary's side. And so thankfully she's okay, but she's very sore. Um, and so through the grace of God and some nice medications, she'll get through the soreness. But that happened on Wednesday. My mom's funeral was on Thursday, okay? We were at the ER till 1 a.m. with Mary. So it's been a week, y'all. It really has. Um, and God is good. We've seen evidence of his mercy all along the way. But, whew, I'm ready for it to slow down. So it's a privilege to be in here and do normal things, like teach Bible class. So that's what I'm doing this morning, and I'm glad to be doing it. I need that normalcy, okay? So if any of you are thinking, oh, he doesn't need to be worried about that, yes, I do. Okay, trust me, I really do. I'm blessed to be able, uh, this church lets me teach a lot, and uh, I enjoy it, and uh, it's very life-giving to me. So I need that right now. So the intent was to cover a lot of the book of Acts. Now we're covering less of it because the quarter's over next week. So what I'm going to try to do today is cover most of Acts 18 and 19, and then we'll finish up the book, Lord willing, next Sunday. So remember Acts 1-8 kind of sets the stage for how the book of Acts progresses. Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So we see the book of Acts expand, starting in the city of Jerusalem, moving its way through Judea and Samaria, all the way up into Syria, to Antioch, where the uh, disciples were first called Christians. Eventually working its way through Asia Minor, all, through all the um, missionary journeys of Paul, and then ultimately to Rome itself, where, Paul, uh, where the book ends with Paul in Rome. I used this very uh, smudged um, flowchart last time to kind of show you where we are in the book of Acts. We're going to be at the end of Paul's second missionary journey here when we get to Acts chapter 18. And geography is going to matter in this one. Okay, so I'm going to refer to some maps. Just try to remember some of the big things. You'll be familiar with the cities um, and maybe even uh, with the, their locations. So this is a zoomed in map of Paul's second missionary journey. Remember I said we're, we're, Acts 18 kind of finishes up the second missionary journey and th starts the third one. And so they leave from Antioch, uh, Syrian Antioch, and they uh, progress through Asia Minor. Now notice, you wind up over here, you notice some important biblical cities like Philippi and Thessalonica. You go through Corinth, okay? So Acts 18 has Corinth and it has Ephesus in it and has a lot of interesting stuff in between. So let's pick up reading in Acts chapter 18. This is verse one. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. 
Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who had heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack you, attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So notice this last part, Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. When Paul went on these missionary journeys, he would stay a while. So he's a year and a half there. He's going to be two years in Ephesus. So it's not surprising then that we have letters to the Ephesians and multiple letters to the Corinthians. These are churches that he knew well and had worked um, a great deal with. In Acts 18, we're introduced for the first time to Aquila and Priscilla. This is a husband and wife duo that are mentioned several times in the New Testament. They are important partners with Paul in the gospel. Several things we could note just from what the text says uh, specifically. So notice, first of all, they're Jewish. Um, It says of Aquila, that's the man, that um, he was from Pontus, which is in Asia Minor, so it's in northern Turkey today. But he'd recently come from Italy, and specifically from Rome, with his wife Priscilla. We'll talk more about her in a moment. Because Claudius, that's the emperor, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome, which I believe happened in 40, now all of a sudden the year escapes me, 47 AD. Um, It seems to be Suetonius, the historian, says it was over something about taxes. And I remember it being very complicated. I haven't studied up on it recently. But the result was he expelled the Jews from Rome and Aquila and Priscilla were caught up in that. Remember, I've said this many times as we studied the book of Acts. A person could be Jewish and be a follower of Jesus. In fact, for many years in the book of Acts, those are the only people you have that are followers of Jesus, are Jewish. They don't stop being Jewish to be Christians. They believe that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. It's we, the Gentiles, who are the weird ones that are brought in. And that's why the book of Acts has these different stories that we studied a few weeks ago about how different Gentiles came to faith. But it's pretty straightforward for the Jews. They just accept Jesus as their Messiah. You know, that's that's the thing. And of course, they believe, they repent, they're baptized, all those things. But I'm saying it's totally natural that you would have the Jews, that these people would still be Jewish. And because of that, when the Jews get persecuted, they're going to get persecuted with them because they're still Jewish. Paul likewise would be considered, uh, was considered himself Jewish. As we looked at before, he describes himself in the book of Acts well after his baptism as a Pharisee. So Paul is Jewish, uh, Aquila and Priscilla are Jewish. And it's clear that they are, um, they're well-educated and they are very knowledgeable in the word of God. So they get mentioned uh, multiple times in Acts 18, but also Uh, elsewhere in the New Testament. So, we just read Acts 18, 2 and 3. Later on, verse 18, Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that, then said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Sincrea. There he shaved his head according to the Jewish custom, marking the end of a vow. Then he set sail for Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. So, they went on Paul's missionary journey now across the sea. They wound up in Ephesus with him. When Priscilla, uh, Acts 18, 26, they're talking about a man named Apollos preaching. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. Paul says in Romans 16, 3, give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. So by this time, they're in Rome. 1 Corinthians 16, 19, the church is here in the province of Asia, send greetings to the Lord, as do Aquila and Priscilla and all the others who gather in their home for church meetings. And then 2 Timothy 4, 19, give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila and those living in the household of Onesiphorus. So these are important people in the early church, important missionaries with Paul. Now, did you notice what happened with the names? So it's Aquila mentioned first, then Priscilla. So the man, then the woman. That's kind of the way the Bible tends to do it. I don't want to make too much out of this, but let's just notice. Later, it's Priscilla and Aquila. He took Priscilla and Aquila with him. And then Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned in Acts 18.26. And then in 
Romans 16.3, greet Priscilla and Aquila. And then 2 Timothy 4.19, my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila. Now, Admittedly, 1 Corinthians 16, it's Aquila and Priscilla, so it's not as if we have some kind of made monumental change. We always say one name first. But the fact that the woman's name is mentioned first is significant. It shows how prominent she was, how important she was in this work. And so we don't, she's not just a footnote. In fact, notice how it says, we're going to talk about Apollos in a moment, but it's Priscilla and Aquila who take Apollos aside. And I, I'm imagining when they sit down in the living room together and they start talking, it might be Priscilla who's actually leading the conversation. I don't know. Just note the fact how prominent she was. So I said a minute ago, I talked a minute about my mother. Mother was a very strong woman, okay, in so many ways. And I did her eulogy so I could talk about her for at least 45 minutes like I did the other day. But I just want to tell you one little story. Um... Growing up in my home meant that we owned businesses. My parents worked a lot and they owned businesses. And eventually they basically had four businesses going at one time, okay? Um, the main, two main ones, my dad's construction business and my mom's income tax business. But they also had office supplies and Radio Shack, okay? So there from 1989 to 2005, you came into Moulton, Alabama, you see CCI Radio Shack. That's owned by my parents, I worked there from time to time, never a good employee, but I was, I was there. I helped, you know, I could prevent shoplifting, I guess, is about the best I could do. Um, I was always there begrudgingly. Um, but anyway, so growing up in the family meant, you know, being in the family business. And when I was, uh, I was tasked after mom died with finding pictures for the slideshow. Okay, so I'm going through all our old pictures. But you can imagine what that's like. You've done it before, right? Some of you have. And so you can't help but see all the other pictures, you know. Anyway, goodness. So I, here I find myself spending several hours just going through all these pictures and thinking all these things. Some about my mom, some, you know, about my childhood and my friends, all that. Came across this one. I didn't know we had it. So this probably was taken in the late 90s. There in the uh, shopping center right beside Piggly Wiggly was um, my parents' store. Now, my mom's tax office was in the back of the store, so if you wanted to go get your taxes done, and a lot of people in Moulton, Alabama do that, they go to the back of the store. Okay, you gotta walk through Radio Shack. Maybe you stop and buy a remote control car or something on the way, or, uh, or a computer or something. Um, but I wanna, I, I promise I'm getting to something. CCI, I told this story at mom's funeral. My sister reminded me of it the other day. I'd forgotten about it. So what, CCI, what does that mean? Well, it stands for Consolidated Concepts Incorporated. Mama came up with that name. She was so proud. Remember, they had four businesses going together. Not all of them naturally went together. So, you know, you're just throwing. But she was real proud. But, but this is where it came from. CCI. My mom's name was Carolyn. My dad's name was, well, everybody called him Irwin, but it was Charles Irwin. Our Charlie is named after him. So CCI, Carolyn and Charles Irwin. Okay, so she had, the, she had the initials, then she had to think of a business name that would go with it, and that's where she got Consolidated Concepts Incorporated. She was so proud of that name, sounded so important, you know. And it's a good business for many years. It's, well, what, what am I saying? It's still a business, and it's still a very successful business. I'm very proud of my mother for what she's done, and the intent is that it's going to keep on going. The Radio Shack part's gone. You probably heard that a few years ago. <laughs> They had already sold, their, uh, sold that part of the business before, before Radio Shack went belly under. So, why well, am I going to point this out? CCI, did you catch whose names first? Carolyn and Charles Irwin. That wasn't by accident, okay? I mean, he worked hard and he did the physical stuff, but she's the one who ran the business, okay? So, when I see Priscilla and Aquila, I can't help but think, all right, I see how that works. Right? They can work together, but she can take the lead a lot of times. So Acts 18 introduces us to Priscilla and Aquila, and they have an important role to play with another character named Apollos. So let's keep reading. In verse 18, so we read verse 18 a moment ago, yeah. Um, he left and set sail with Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sincrea because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. 
When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it's God's will. Then he set sail for Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Okay, so Paul moves on, but he leaves them there in Corinth. Priscilla and Aquila, verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So, here's here's the scene. You've got in Corinth, Priscilla and Aquila. But Paul's not there anymore. He's going out and about, doing his work. Now, verse 24, we're introduced to Apollos. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So much to talk about here, but I'll have to try not to get consumed in all the details. Just a few things worth noting. Lots of question marks on what's going on in some of these texts. So for instance, it says before Paul sailed, he had his hair cut off because of a vow he had taken. What's that? Well, Luke doesn't explain anything else to us aside from he shaved his head or he had his hair cut off because he'd taken a vow. So we know that there's some significance to it. It wasn't just that he needed a haircut. Um, And so if you look in the commentaries, you're gonna see all kinds of guesses as to what this was. Now, the first place you'd normally wanna go is, is a Nazarite vow because that's mentioned in Numbers chapter six. So that's an Old Testament thing. You read about Nazarites. So somebody who takes a vow that they're not gonna shave their head until they do it after they've completed their vow, they go to the temple and they present themselves to the priest. And I think the hair is supposed to be shaved in and burned there um, on the altar. So here's the thing. If it's a Nazarite vow, it's weird that he had his hair cut now because he should wait until Jerusalem, until he's at the temple to do that. So it doesn't seem to be a Nazarite vow, not, not at least explicitly, unless there's something going on we're missing here. Like maybe there were two stages of getting your hair cut and we just don't know about them. There's so many things about history we're just lost to us, right? Um, it could also be that this is what we might consider a personal vow that he took before God. Now, it already mentioned earlier that, you know, God spoke to Paul from time to time and encouraged him and said, look, I have many people in this city and that kind of thing. And so it's clear that Paul had his own personal relationship with God outside of everything the book of Acts says. And so it could be that maybe prompted by God or just prompted by something in his own spirit, Paul made a vow to God and said, I'm going to keep it. And part of his vow was to shave his head. So a reminder that each of us is going to have our own personal relationship with God and it's never completely devoid of our relationship with other people certainly never devoid of the commandments of scripture but at the same time it might make sense that sometimes I make a vow to God that I don't expect you to keep that's okay scripture is really clear you can make vows to God but if you make them keep them it's important that's old testament but that's new testament too so don't ever make a vow to God lightly So Paul makes this vow. There were also times when uh, Gentiles, you know, not that didn't believe in the God of Israel, they shaved their heads for certain vows. And so there's all kinds of research been done on, could this have been more of a Greco-Roman thing? Maybe so, I don't know. We just don't have enough information. He has hair cut off because of a vow. It doesn't say a vow to the Lord, so eh. But anyway, there it is. Remember I said I wasn't gonna get caught up in all the details? That was me getting caught up in all the details right there. And none of you stopped me. You just let me go on and on. I'm kidding. Okay, keep moving. That's right. I was in the middle of uh, my mom's funeral. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, I, got, I would get choked up a little bit <laughs> from time to time. And finally, I said, Mama would say, Michael, move on. Okay? 
She would, really. She's like, look, you're wasting these people's time. And uh, so I'll try to remind myself of that this morning. So let's talk about Apollos. Stated explicitly, he's a Jew. Remember, we're dealing with mostly Jewish Christians at this point. By the time we're in Acts 18, it's not all Jewish Christians, but it's still mostly Jewish Christians. Um, He's a native of Alexandria. I have a map. Let's see. So I have a, yeah, here we go. This is one of those big confusing maps with so much on it, kind of knock you over. Uh, But I know you're going to try to get all that information. Do that for me in a second. Right now, just notice this. So here's a picture of the Mediterranean area. Here's Israel right over here. Here's Egypt. There's Alexandria. Okay. So an important Greek, then Roman city. Uh, A great center of learning in the ancient world. A great Jewish center. And because it was a great Jewish center, it became a great Christian center. A lot of the greatest thinkers in Judaism and in Christianity came out of Alexandria. Um, And Apollos was one of them, okay? Um, Apollos of Alexandria. So let's go back, uh, let's see, I'll go forward to my text or back. So he was a native of Alexandria, but he came to Ephesus, okay? So let's see, let's go back on our map just a moment. So Ephesus is over here in Asia Minor, okay, so Turkey. And Achaia, the province of Achaia, Roman province of Achaia is over here. This is Greece, okay. So you can see that it's close geographically. Corinth and Ephesus are close to each other, but they are separated by water. So it's not just as easy as walking there. You either got to get a ship across or you got to go by land. Um, So at this moment, (coughs) pardon me. Quill and Priscilla are in Corinth, and Apollos is in Ephesus. Um, what do we know about Apollos, uh, other than the fact he's Jewish? Well, notice what it says. He was a learned man. And the, and the way that's uh, composed in Greek, it was a common phrase to talk about someone who was highly educated. Okay? So this is something that pagans would say about their learned people, just like uh, Jews and Christians would. He was a learned man. He especially was knowledgeable of the scriptures. So he knew what we call the Old Testament. New Testament was still being constructed at this time. So the scriptures here refers to the Old Testament. Now notice what else it says about him. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. I think I have this on a different slide. So so yeah, he'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. So he knew about the Lord the God of Israel, obviously he's Jewish, um, but he'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and here we mean the Lord Jesus. So he is a Jew who is a follower of Jesus and it makes that explicit. He spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. Okay, so this is a Jewish believer, someone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. And if that's all it said, then we would you know, Apollos just kind of clicks with Priscilla and Aquila and with Paul and uh, the other believers in Jesus. And then we get our first big question, which is, what was going on with Apollos and baptism? It says that he only knew the baptism of John. And that means the, the baptism of John the Baptist. This is a puzzle for several reasons. Number one, um, does that mean that he was a disciple of John the Baptist somewhere along the way? I think that's likely. It's a guess. But one of the things you notice as you work through the book of Acts is John the Baptist keeps being mentioned. He's going to get mentioned in Acts 19 as well. But he's mentioned earlier when uh, Peter gave his speech to Cornelius and his family, he mentioned John the Baptist. When they replaced Judas um, the apostle, uh, with another apostle, they had cri- the criteria they laid out was it had to be someone who w- was with us from the baptism of John. Okay, so John the Baptist, he's a real important figure. Some of you have followed enough of my classes to know I could talk about John the Baptist for hours. I think we really miss so much about what the Bible says about John the Baptist. Um, Think about three or four Gospels all tell the story of John the Baptist before they tell the story of Jesus. It's it's really remarkable. No man born of a woman is greater than John. That's what Jesus said about him. 
I mean, there's just so much to be said about John the Baptist. I'm going to keep myself from doing it, but I am confident in saying this. John the Baptist had a really big movement. He wasn't a flash in the pan. So Jesus at one time could be said to be a disciple of John the Baptist himself. He was baptized by him, wasn't he? But even if we don't qualify Jesus exactly like that, John's movement stayed on for a long time after he died. How do I know this? Well, first of all, you got this guy named Apollos who knows we're, we're literally 18, 20 years after the resurrection. And here's somebody who only knows the baptism of John the Baptist. Okay? But if you think that's weird, wait till we get to the next chapter. It gets even weirder. Okay? So he only knew the baptism of John, which my understanding would be that he was a follower of Jesus but had only received baptism as a follower of John the Baptist. So he learned of Jesus as Messiah but had not received Christian baptism. The reason that I don't love that explanation is because of what it doesn't say. Because, let's go back here, it doesn't say that they corrected him and he was baptized. What it says is this, they invited him, that's Priscilla and Aquila, into their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So he needed to learn some more about baptism and specifically about what we call Christian baptism, baptism in the name of Jesus. But if he hadn't been baptized in the name of Jesus, what I want it to say is, and he was baptized. It doesn't say that. We can assume he was. Some commentators do that. Some preachers do that. Maybe he was. Or we can assume he wasn't. We just don't know, right? If you go by what it says in chapter 19, then maybe we would assume he was. But on the other hand, the people we read about in chapter 19 don't, clearly don't know near as much about the scriptures as Apollos does. So I don't know that we should necessarily consider them equals. Okay, so this is where I think it's important for those of us in the churches of Christ to kind of pause and think about baptism for a minute. On the one hand, baptism is eminently important in the New Testament. I mean, it is the way you mark your beginning in the, your uh, Christian walk. It's the thing. It is for the remission of sins. Okay, so I think we stand on very firm ground when we call people to Jesus, and as part of their walk, they make the decision to be baptized. I mean, I think that's very scriptural. What that doesn't do is answer all the questions that come up <laughs> Because the world is never so neat and tidy as we want it to be. What about people who believe and aren't baptized? What about people who are baptized in different kinds of churches? What about people who are baptized when they're babies? And I'll say this, I do think there are good scriptures to lean on and say this is the way we're going to do it. But I also say, look, there's some questions. And I don't know all the answers. And I look at a text like this and I go, hmm, that's That's interesting. And if it said that Apollos had to, be re, had to be baptized, then I would feel better about saying something like that. But instead, I mean, I have to leave over the possibility that here he was, a believer in Jesus, who actually hadn't received Christian baptism. What? And that was okay. Now, I'm leaving it open. I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be, but that God doesn't have to do it the way I, I think he's supposed to do it. So I'm just leaving open the possibility and what you're going to see I'm going to do is come back to the fact, what do we teach? We teach baptism for the remission of sins. Okay, I think that's scriptural. But realize that we don't have to have every single scenario envisioned and answered for, okay? Because the scriptures give us some complicated ones. Again, wait till Acts 19 and then it really gets complicated. What I love about it is that clearly he was... Uh, in disagreement with them on baptism. He was teachable. So it should be noted that he was willing to learn more about baptism, but it's also important to note how Priscilla and Aquila approached it. They said, we love what you're doing. You're an awesome man of God. Let's just talk about this though. And they sat down with him and they explained the way of God more accurately. Now, if you're gonna make an argument that... Um, well, let me, let me back up. Now, let's talk a little bit about the baptism of John. What was the baptism of John? Well, let's let the scriptures tell us what it was rather than guess, okay? 
What was the baptism of John? Mark tells us very clearly in Mark chapter 1. Remember I said the first thing that three of the Gospels do is tell the story of John the Baptist before Jesus? Mark is one of them. It says the beginning of the good news in the Gospel about Jesus. And then immediately starts talking about John the Baptist. Okay? Verse 2 starts talking about John the Baptist. I'll send my messenger ahead of you. All right, so that's quotes uh, from Isaiah about John the Baptist. Verse 4, and so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So, what was John's baptism about? Repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Don't miss the forgiveness of sins part. That applied to John's baptism as well. So, you know, kind of do the math on this. Apollos' sins had been forgiven. Um, now, does that, does that mean that he does, that, you know, that, that works in the Christian era too? Again, it's just a question I have. I don't know the answer to it. I wish I did. I don't have all the answers. But also notice this, very important thing to note. The difference between Jesus' baptism and John the Baptist's baptism, now technically Jesus didn't baptize, the disciples did. The difference is the Holy Spirit. Okay? John says that clearly, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And that's the distinction you see. People who receive John's baptism don't receive the Holy Spirit. People who receive Jesus' baptism do. So what about Apollo? So let's go back here and look at this text again. This is the way the NIV says it. One of those places where the NIV is like, well, why'd you do that? You know, you make a decision for us and you can kind of miss something that might be important. He spoke with great fervor, it says, which might be what it's getting at. But let me just show you the, how it says it in some other translations. New Living Translation says, he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit. English Standard Version, being fervent in spirit. King James, being fervent in spirit. Same for New King James. There are a lot of people who think this is actually talk, talking about the fact that he has the spirit of God. So even though it's a lowercase s, they're telling you they think it's his personal spirit. It very much could refer to the fact that the Holy Spirit is doing this through him. If that's the case, Apollos already has the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have to be baptized. He's got forgiveness of sins and he's received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there, maybe. I'm gonna throw a lot of maybes out. I could be wrong. Um, but notice that. Now, that's very different than what happens over in chapter 19. So, uh, let's see, we went over the, they explained the way of God to him more adequately. Everything we can tell here is, after this encounter with Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos is good to go. Right? He's received the instruction he needed, and now he's ready to go out and uh, speak the word of God correctly. So, that's exactly what happens. He wanted to go to Achaia. That's the province where Corinth is. So just mentally roll over to 1 Corinthians for a minute. You remember the divisions that were happening in the Corinthian church? Some people said, I am of Cephas, I'm of Peter. Others said, I'm of Paul. Others said, I'm of Apollos. Apollos is a big deal in the Corinthian church eventually, okay? He's a major Christian character in the first century. Martin Luther speculated that Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews. It's probably wrong, but still, he's, he's a candidate. Why? Well, because it has a lot of what you call um, uh, Hellenistic or Greek Jewish influence, which is true of Alexandria, which is where he was from. But anyway, so he goes to Achaia, he goes to Corinth, <coughs> excuse me, um, and he was a great help to those who refuted the Jewish opponents, the Jews who didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And publicly he could debate them. Remember, he knows the scriptures very well. All right. And now that's the last verse of chapter 18. This gets us into chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. So remember our two cities, Corinth and Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. 
Remember I said if Apollos presents some challenges, this text especially does. Let me tell you two things I, that immediately stand out to me among the many. Number one, they are called disciples. They're disciples. What does that mean? Well, I mean, you know, disciple means follower, but disciples of whom? Usually, when the book of Acts uses that word, it's talking about disciples of Jesus. It doesn't have to, but usually it is. That's kind of the natural way you read it. But a lot of times you read uh, commentators, and I'm talking about very conservative commentators, they'll call them disciples of John the Baptist for good reason. I lean towards Jesus, okay? This is why. Second word here, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Believed what? Well, again, this usually in Acts is talking about believing in Jesus. So it seems to me these people are Jesus followers, probably. But it would be very surprising if they are Jesus followers for the rest of this stuff to take place. Paul knows something is up with them. Maybe he's hearing some things that he's unfamiliar with or maybe, maybe they're teaching some weird things or maybe God's spirit in him is telling them they need to know more. I don't know. But either way, Paul knows something is up. So he finds these disciples and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He had an inkling that they hadn't. What, dis- what differentiated John's baptism from Jesus' baptism? The Holy Spirit, right? That's exactly what we see here. Then they say, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. What? It almost certainly, now David Young always warns us not to, do, not, not to casually do this, but it almost certainly doesn't mean exactly what it says. Let me tell you what I mean by that, all right, before I get kicked off the stage. They probably had heard the Holy Spirit, okay? So let's say they're Jewish believers. I mean, they're Jewish almost certainly because they received John the Baptist's baptism. The Jews believed in the Holy Spirit. There's lots of teaching about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, okay? So the fact that the Holy Spirit existed would probably not be what this is saying. Instead, more likely, it's that we didn't realize that the era of the Holy Spirit had begun, that the Holy Spirit had already come. That's my guess, okay? And that's what most Bible commentators will say. Maybe we're all wrong, but that, um, so it's not so much about the existence of the Holy Spirit, but that, that the Holy Spirit has come, that kind of thing. All right, so we didn't realize it was time for us to be getting the Holy Spirit. And so that would be a puzzle to Paul because the normal way that this is done is a person believes and they're baptized and they receive the Holy Spirit. That's the normal pattern. Not always that pattern in the book of Acts. There are important exceptions, but the normal way to do it is to believe and to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. So if they don't know about the Holy Spirit, then he's got to ask them about their baptism. And it's John's baptism again. So Paul has to catch them up to speed. John's baptism was a bad baptism of repentance. They'd done that part. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. Now, that kind of sounds like maybe they didn't know who Jesus was. But they're already disciples. So remember, I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled by these people. But one thing is for sure they are baptized, and I use the word hesitantly because it's not scriptural. They're rebaptized. Okay? They're baptized now with Christian baptism, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, under the authority of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul lays his hands on them, and they have outward manifestations of the Holy Spirit. This confirms to Paul and to them that, yes, they are accepted by God. That's one of the main roles of the giving of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is to say God has uh, has, uh, put his seal of blessing on this. That's what happens in Cornelius' household when when, when Peter is preaching to them in the middle of his sermon, the Holy Spirit falls on the people and then what's Peter gonna do? He's gotta baptize them. They've already got the Holy Spirit. All right, so they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they are, I would argue, they receive the Holy Spirit. When Paul lays his hands on them, then they demonstrate that they have gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's me inserting some things in there. That's my theology working so that 
I believe all Christians receive the Holy Spirit when they're baptized. And then some people receive special manifestations of that. And one of the ways that you see that is an apostle lays on their hands and the people have <clears throat> those gifts. Could be wrong. <clears throat> and by the way, there are 12 men in all. And I think Luke is trying to tell us don't be too caught up on the 12 part because naturally I'd be like, wait a second, 12? That's important. Then he says there were about 12. <laughs> so, you know, could have been 11, could have been 13, Baker's dozen, you know. It, the important thing being that we've got these followers of John the Baptist 20-something years after the resurrection of Jesus, way over in Ephesus. You see the influence of John the Baptist? I mean, it's going way throughout the Mediterranean. Um, okay, so I'll tell you one story and then uh, end it up. I was in college and I was a counselor at Camp Wiregrass down in South Alabama, Christian camp. And it was senior week, so we had, you know, uh, kids in high school there. And uh, those of you from a Church of Christ background, some of this will sound familiar. Um, and I'd say, you know, I'm very thankful for the Church of Christ. I'm very proud to be a member. And, um, but I tend to know our strengths and our weaknesses. And put a great emphasis on baptism, always have. And especially when I was young, we put a great emphasis on baptism. So much so about you having the right baptism that a lot of us would sit around thinking, ugh, am I, did I really have the right baptism? Did I believe enough? You know, that kind of thing. And even though the preacher would say you didn't have to think that way, we were thinking that way. A lot of us weren't real sure about our baptisms. Because, you know, almost every sermon was a, an appeal to be baptized. And it's like, oh, maybe I should do this again. So at Camp Wiregrass, you know, uh, camp is an emotional time and kids are really sharing their lives and crying and all that kind of stuff. Oh, it was wonderful. Awesome time experience. However, one of the leaders, the teenage leaders, a guy who would be the camper of the week, everybody looked up to him. Later, he was Mr. Fried Hardeman. Okay, I tell you, this is, this is our guy. Here he is, 17 years old. He decides he needs to be rebaptized. Okay, he asked me to do it. Um, and so I sat and talked with him for a long time. The director of the camp came. I was like 20 years old, okay? So I didn't know what I was doing. The director of the camp comes. We all sit down and talk. We're not going to refuse to let this man be baptized, but he's, he's already baptized when he's about 12 years old, okay? What happens next, y'all? Pretty soon, every kid in that camp thinks they need to be rebaptized, okay? So we've got a crisis on our hands here. Because is that really what we want? to make everybody doubt their own baptism. But what they're thinking of is, if this guy isn't legit, there's no way I am, you know? That's the way kids are gonna think. And I was like, oh man. I mean, literally, we had a bunch of kids that wanted to be rebaptized. The director of the camp, his name's Ross Mitchell. He works at the Fort Walton Beach Church of Christ now. Wonderful man. After we baptized a couple, he said, now, let me, let me say this. You know, we honor appeals to be baptized. But I also want you to understand that there are really no scriptural reasons to be rebaptized. All you need to do to be baptized is believe in Jesus, okay? And he mentioned the story of Apollos and that, and then in Acts 19, these people who were rebaptized, but that's because they didn't really understand what they were doing. And he said, look, if you just had a very basic understanding, it was good enough, okay? And he went, he spent a few minutes doing that and, and whew, let the air out of that balloon. There were a few kids that were baptized and I'm not trying to make light of it, but really, we didn't want it to look to parents as if we're telling their kids they're all going to hell when they're really good Christian kids that have been baptized and trying to live right for Jesus, you know. Um, anyway, he handled it, handled it masterfully and he used these texts to talk about, to kind of talk about the rebaptism thing and maybe when you would do it and not do it and, and it was good, okay? So I'm gonna finish up. I realize I'm going over now. Um, so, if you look at Christian history after this point, one thing's very clear in Christian history. Christians believed in baptism for the remission of sins. That's what we should teach. So I'll just show you the Nicene Creed, which we don't recite in this church, but I want, to, want you to notice that it mentions that I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Okay? 
early Christian documents, the Shepherd of Hermas, there is um, no other repentance except that which takes place when we went down to the water and obtained the remission of our former sins. And so, anyway, if you want to take a picture of this, you can. These are early Christian leaders all talking about the necessity of baptism for forgiveness of sins, okay? So, throughout the, the early centuries of the church, this was understood that baptism is the way that you enter into the Christian community, the way you receive forgiveness of sins. Yes, there are questions about people who don't do it exactly in that order, okay? But scripturally, we're gonna go with believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus, and then you're good. You really are good. You don't need to do it again. And you, as John says in 1 John, you have a continually wash, you're continually washed, continually cleansed of your sins. You don't have to be baptized over and over every time you sin. I bring that up just because Acts 18 and 19 presents questions, but I think we should still lean heavily on the scriptures that teach us baptism for the remission of sins. Okay, you've been, um, you've bared with me longer than you should. Thanks so much for your attention. You're dismissed.